Book 11. Agamemnon's Day of Glory Now Dawn rose up from bed by her lordly maid to Thonis, bringing light to immortal gods and mortal men. But Zeus flung strife on Achaea's fast ships, the brutal goddess flaring his storm shield, his monstrous sign of war in both her fists. She stood on Odysseus's huge, black-bellied hull, moored midline so a shout could reach both wings, up shore to Telamonian and Ajax camp, or down to Achilles. Trusting so, their arms' power and battle strength, they hauled their trim ships up on either flank. There, Strife took her stand, raising her high-pitched cry, great and terrible, lashing the fighting fury in each Achaean's heart, no stopping them now, mad for war and struggle. Now suddenly, battle thrilled them more than the journey home, than sailing hollow ships to their dear native land. Agamemnon cried out too, calling men to arms and harnessed up in gleaming bronze himself. First, he wrapped his legs with well-made greaves, fastened behind the heels with silver ankle clasps. And next, he strapped the breastplate round his chest that Cyrus gave him once, a guest gift long ago. The rousing rumor of war had carried far as Cyprus, how the Achaean ships were launching war on Troy, so he gave the king that gear to please his spirit. Magnificent. Ten bands of blue enamel spanned it, spaced by twelve of gold and twenty of beaten tin, and dark blue serpents writhed towards the throat, three each side, shimmering bright as rainbows arched on the clouds by Cronus's son, a sign of mortal men. Then... Over his shoulder, Agamemnon slung his sword, golden studs at the hilt, the blades burnished bright, and the scabbard sheathed in silver swung on golden straps. And he grasped a well-wrought shield to encase his body, forged for rushing for rays. Beautiful, blazoned work. Circling the center, ten strong rings of bronze, with twenty discs of glittering tin set in. At the heart, a boss of bulging blue steel. And there, like a crown, the gorgon's grim mask, the burning eyes, the stark, transfixing horror, and round her strode the shapes of rout and fear. The shield belt glinted silver, and rippling on it ran a dark blue serpent, two heads coiling round a third, reared from a single neck and twisting left and right. Then, over his broad brow, Agamemnon set his helmet fronted with four knobs and forked with twin horns, and the horsehair crest atop it, tossing, bristling terror. And last, he picked up two tough spears, tipped in bronze, honed sharp, and the glare flashed off their brazen points and pierced the high skies. And awestruck at the sight, Athena and Hera loosed a crack of thunder, exalting the great king of Messene, rich in gold. At once, each captain shouted out commands to his driver. Rain the team by the trench. Good battle order now. While the men themselves, armed for full assault, leapt down and swarmed to the trench's edge on foot, and a long, undying roar went up in the early dawn. Well ahead of the war cars, they reached the brink. Closed ranks as drivers backed them yards behind. But Zeus drove a swirl of panic deep in their lines, and down from the vaulting skies released a shower of raining blood for Zeus was bent on hurling down to the house of death a rout of sturdy fighters. Trojans, the other side on the plain's high ground, formed around tall Hector, staunch Polydemus, Aeneas loved by Trojans like a god, and Antinor's sons, Polybus, Prince Agenor, and Acamas, still unwed, three men in their prime, like gods who never die. Hector bore his round shield in the forefront, blazing out like the dog star through the clouds, all withering fire, then plunging back into the cloud rack, massed and dark. So Hector ranged on, now flaring along the front, now shouting his orders back toward the rear, all of him armed in bronze, a flash like lightning flung by Father Zeus with his battle shield of thunder. And the men, like gangs of reapers slashing down the reaping rows and coming closer, Closer across the field of a warlord, rich in wheat or barley, swaths by the armfuls, falling thick and fast, so Achaeans and Trojans closed and slashed, lunging into each other, and neither side now had a thought of flight that would have meant disaster. No, the pressure of combat locked them head to head, 
lunging like wolves, in strife, with wild groans, exulted to see them, glaring down at the melee, strife alone of the immortals hovering over the fighters. The other gods kept clear, at their royal ease, reclining off in the halls where the roofs of each were built for the ages, high on a rugged, ridged Olympus. All were blaming Zeus, with his storming dark clouds, because the father decreed to hand the Trojans glory, but the father paid no heed to them. Retiring peaks apart from the other gods, he sat aloof, glorying in his power, gazing out over the city walls of Troy and the warships of Achaea, the flash of bronze, fighters killing, fighters killed. As long as morning rose and the blessed day grew stronger, the weapons hurtled side to side and men kept falling. But just when the woodsman makes his morning meal, deep in a mountain forest, arm weary from chopping the big heavy trunks, and his heart has had enough, and the sudden longing for tempting food overtakes the man and makes his senses whirl. Just at the height of morning, the Argives smashed battalions, their courage breaking through, and they shattered ranks of cohorts on along the lines. And right in the midst sprang Agamemnon first and killed a fighter, Binor, veteran captain, then his aide Oleus, lashing on their team. Down from the car he'd leapt, squaring off, charging in full fury, full face, straight into Agamemnon's spearhead, ramming sharp. The rim of the bronze helmet could not hold it. Clean through the heavy metal and bone, the point burst, and the brains splattered all inside the cask. He battled Oleus down, despite the Trojans' rage, and the Lord of Fighters left them lying there, both dead, and their chests gleamed like bronze as he stripped them bare. Then he went for Isis and Antiphus, killed and stripped the two sons of Priam, one a bastard, one royal blood, and both riding a single car, the bastard driving, the famous Antiphus standing poised beside him. Achilles had caught them once on the spurs of Ida, bound them with willow ropes as they watched their flocks and set them free for ransom. But now it was Agamemnon, lord of the far-flung kingdoms, catching up with Isis. He stabbed his chest with a spear above the nipple. Antiphus, he hacked with a sword across the ear, and hurled him from his chariot, rushing fast to rip the splendid armor off their bodies. He knew them both. He'd seen them once by the ships when the swift Achilles dragged them in from Ida. Think how a lion, mauling the soft, weak young of a running deer, clamped in his massive jaws, cracks their backbones with a snap. He stormed in, invading the lair to tear their tender hearts out, and the mother doe, even if she's close by, what can she do to save her fawns? She's helpless. Terrible trembling racks her body too. And suddenly, off she bounds, through the glades and the thick woods, drenched in sweat, leaping clear of the big cat's pounds. Not a single Trojan could save those two from death. They fled themselves before the Argive charge. But next, Agamemnon killed Pisander, in combat hard Hippolychus, two sons of Antimachus, that cunning, politic man, whom Paris bribed with gold and sumptuous gifts, so he was the first to fight the return of Helen to red-haired Menelaus. Now, powerful Agamemnon caught his two sons riding the same chariot, both struggling to curb their high-strung team. The reins slipped their grasp. Both horses panicked as Agamemnon ramped up in their faces like a lion, both fighters shouting from their chariot, pleading, "'Take us alive, Atreides! Take a ransom worth our lives!' Vast treasures are piled up in the Antimachus house, bronze and gold, and plenty of well-wrought iron. Father would give you anything, gladly. Priceless ransom, if only he learns we're still alive in Argive ships. So they cried to the king, cries for mercy, but only a merciless voice in answer. Cunning Antimachus, so you're the man's sons? Once in the Trojan council, he ordered Menelaus there on an embassy joined by King Odysseus, Murdered right on the spot. No safe conduct. Back to the land of Argos. You're his sons? Now pay for your father's outrage. Blood for blood. And he pitched Pisander off the chariot onto the earth, and plunged a spear into his chest. The man crashed on his back, as Hippolychus leapt away. But him he killed on the ground, slashing off his arms with a sword, lopping off his head, and he sent him rolling through the carnage like a log. He left them there for dead, and just at the point where most battalions scattered, Agamemnon charged, 
the rest of his troops in armor, quick behind him now. Infantry killing infantry, fleeing headlong. Hard-pressed drivers killing drivers, under the onrush dust and whirlwinds driven up by the plane. Hoofs of stallions, rumbling thunder, bronze flashing, immense slaughter, and always King Agamemnon whirling to kill, crying his argives on, breakneck on like devouring fire roaring down onto dry, dead timber. Squalls hurling it on, careening left and right, and brush ripped up by the roots goes tumbling under, crushed by the blasting fire rampaging on. So under Atreides' onslaught, Trojans dropped in flight. Stampedes of massive stallions dragged their empty chariots, clattering down the passageways of battle. Stallions, yearning to feel their master's hands at the reins, but there they lie, sprawled across the field, craved far more by vultures than by wives. But Zeus drew Hector out of range of the weapons, out of the dust storm, out of the mountain kills, the blood and rout of war as Atreides followed hard, shouting his argives on, furious, never stopping. The Trojans shrieked in flight past Elisbaro, ancient son of Dardanus, past the midfield mark of the plain, and past the wild fig, and struggling to reach Troy and always in hot pursuit and shrieking. Agamemnon splattered with gore, his hands, invincible hands. But once they reached the sea and gates and the great oak, there the two sides halted, waiting each other's charge. Yet stragglers, still stampeded down the plain like cattle, driven wild by a lion, lunging in pitch darkness down on the whole herd. But to one alone, a sudden death comes flashing. First, he snaps its neck, clamped in his huge jaws. Then... Down in gulps, he bolts its blood and guts. So King Agamemnon coursed his quarry, always cutting the straggler from the mass, and they, they fled in terror, squads amuck, spilling out of their chariots face first, or slammed onto their backs beneath Atreides' hands, storming and thrusting his spear and lunging on. But just as he was about to reach the steep city, up under the walls, the father of men and gods, descending out of the heavens, took his throne on the high ridge of Ida with all her springs. Holding fast in his grip a lightning bolt, he drove Iris down in a rush of golden wings to bear his message. Away with you now, Iris. Quick as the wind and speed this word to Hector. So long as he sees Lord Marshal Agamemnon storming among the champions, mowing columns down in blood, Hector must hold back, command the rest of his men to fight the enemy, stand their headlong charge. But as soon as a spear or bowshot wounds the king, and Atreides mounts his chariot once again, then I will hand Hector the power to kill, and kill till he cuts his way to the benched ships, and the sun sinks, and the blessed darkness sweeps across this earth. So he commanded. Windquick Iris obeyed at once, and down from Ida's peaks she drove to sacred Troy, found the son of wise King Priam. Shining Hector, standing amidst his teams and bolted cars, and swift as a breeze beside him, Iris called. Hector, son of Priam, a mastermind like Zeus, the father has sped me down to tell you this. So long as you see Lord Marshal Agamemnon storming among the champions, mowing columns down in blood, you must hold back. Command the rest of your men to fight the enemy, standing their headlong charge. But soon as a spear or bowshot wounds the king, and Atreides mounts his chariot once again, then Zeus will hand you the power to kill, and kill till you cut your way to the bench ships, and the sun sinks, and the blessed darkness sweeps across the earth. And Iris, racing the wind, went veering off. Hector leapt to the ground from his chariot, fully armed and brandishing two sharp spears, went striding down his lines, ranging flank to flank driving his fighters into battle, rousing grisly war, and round the Trojans' world, bracing to meet the Argives face to face. But against their mass, the Argives close ranks. The fighting about to break, the troops squaring off, and Atreides, tense to outfight them all, charged first. Sing to me now, you muses, who hold the halls of Olympus. Who was the first to go up against King Agamemnon? Who of the Trojans, or famous Trojan allies? Iphidamus, the rough and rangy son of Antenor, bred in the fertile land of Thrace, mother of flocks. Cecius reared him at home while he was little. His mother's father, 
who sired the fine beauty of Theano. But once he hit the stride of his youth and ached for fame, Cecius tried to hold him back, gave him a daughter's hand, but warm from the bridal chamber marched the groom. Fired up by word that Achaea's troops had landed, twelve braked ships sailed out in his command, trim vessels he left behind with him in Percoti, making his way to Troy to fight on foot. And here he came now, up against Agamemnon, closer, closing. Atreides hurled and missed, his spear shaft just slanting aside the man's flank, as Aphidimus went for the waist beneath the breastplate. He stabbed home, leaning into the below full weight, trusting his heavy hand but failed to pierce the glittering belt. Failed, flat out, the point smashing against the silver, bent back like lead. And seizing the spear shaft, powerful Agamemnon dragged it towards him, tussling like some lion and wrenching it free from Aphidimus' slack grasp. He hacked his neck with a sword and loosed his limbs, and there he dropped, and slept the sleep of bronze, poor soldier, striving to help his fellow Trojans, far from his wedded wife, his new bride. No joy had he known from her for all his gifts. The full hundred oxen he gave her on the spot, then promised a thousand head of goats and sheep from the boundless herds he'd rounded up himself. Now the son of Atreus stripped him, robbed his corpse, and strode back to his waiting Argive armies, hoisting the gleaming gear. But Koan marked him. Koan, Antinor's oldest son, a distinguished man-at-arms, and stinging grief went misting down his eyes for his fallen brother. In from the blind side he came. Agamemnon never saw him. Tensed with a spear and slashed him under the elbow, down the forearm. A glint of metal. The point ripped through his flesh, and the lord of fighting men Atreides shuddered. Not that he quit the foray even then. He sprang at Koan, gripping his big spear shaft through the gusting wind that whipped its tree. Koan was just dragging his brother, foot first, wild now to retrieve his own father's son, calling for help from all the bravest men. But as Koan hauled the body through the press, Agamemnon lunged up under his boss's shield, thrust home hard with the polished bronze point, unstrung his limbs, and reared and lopped his head and the head tumbled onto the fallen brother's corpse. So then and there, under royal Agamemnon's hands, the two sons of Antinor filled out their fates, and down they plunged to the strong house of death. But the king kept ranging, battle ranks on ranks, and thrusting his spear and sword, and hurling heavy rocks, so long as the blood came flowing warm from his wound. But soon, the gash dried, and firm clots formed. Sharp pain came bursting in on Atreides' strength. Spear sharp as the labor pains that pierce a woman, agonies brought on by the harsh birthing spirits, Hera's daughters who hold the stabbing power of birth, so sharp the throws that burst on Atreides' strength. And back he sprang into the car and told his driver to make for the hollowed ships, racked with pain, but he loosed a shrill cry to all of his men. Friends, Lord of the Argives, O oh my captains, your turn now. Keep on shielding our fast ships from this latest mass attack. Zeus, who rules the world, forbids me to battle Trojans all day long. A crack of the lash and his driver whipped the team with streaming manes straight for the curved ships, and on they flew, holding nothing back, their heaving chests foaming, bellies pelted with dust, rushing the wounded warlord free and clear of battle. There, Hector signaled. Seeing Atreides hurt and speeding off the lines, he gave a ringing shout for his troops and allies. Trojans! Lycians! Dardan fighters, hand to hand! Now be men, my friends, call up your battle fury! Their best man cuts and runs. Zeus is handing me glory! Awesome glory! Drive your horses right at these mighty Argives! Seize the higher triumph! Seize it now! Hector! Whipping the fight in fire in each man like a huntsman, crying on his hounds, their white fangs flashing, harrying savage game, some wild boar or lion. So at Achaea's ranks, he drove his fearless Trojans, Hector, son of Priam, a match for murderous Ares. The prince himself went wading into the front lines, his hopes soaring, and down he hurled onto the fray, like a sudden killer squall that blasts down on the dark blue sea, to whip and chop its crests. Who was the first he slaughtered? Who was the last? Hector, the son of Priam. Now Zeus gave him glory? Asaeus first, Otonus next, then Opides, Dolops, Glyteus' son, Ophelidas, 
Agalaeus, Asimnus, and Orus. Hipponus, staunch in combat. These were the Argive captains Hector killed, then went for the main mass, like the west wind battering soft shining clouds the south wind wafts along. In deep, explosive blasts it strikes, and the great swelling waves roll on and on, and the spray goes shooting up from under the wind's hurl, swerving, roaring down the sea. So wildly Hector routed the packed lines of fighters caught in his onslaught. Now, there would have been havoc, irreversible chaos, fleeing bands of Achaeans flung back on their ships if Odysseus had not shouted to Diomedes. What is wrong with us? Forgetting our battle fury? Come here, old friend, stand by me. What humiliation if Hector with that flashing helmet takes our ships? Powerful Diomedes took his challenge quickly. I'll stand and fight, by God, and take the worst but little joy it will bring our comrades now. Zeus, the king of the clouds, has pitched on victory for the Trojans, not for us. But all the same, they hurled Thimbrius down to the ground from his car. Diomedes speared his left breast, as Odysseus killed the warlord's aid in arms, Molion, tall as a god, and left them there for dead. Their fighting finished. Then, both went thrashing into the lines to make a slaughter, as two wild boars, bristling, rampaging back for the kill, fling themselves on yelping packs that hunt them. Back they whirled on attack, and laid Trojans low, while Achaeans, just in flight from Hector's onset, leapt at the chance to gather a second wind. At once, they took two lords of the realm and seized their car, the two good sons of Merops, out of Percoti Harbor. Merops adept beyond all men in the Mantic Arts. He refused to let his two boys march to war, this man-killing war. But the young ones fought him all the way. The forces of Black Death drove them on, and Diomedes, a marvel with a spear, destroyed them both, stripped them of life breath, and tore their gear away. And Odysseus, killed Hippodamus, killed Hippiricus. And there, gazing down from his ridge on Ida, the son of Cronus stretched the rope of battle tense and taut, as the fighters kept on killing side to side. Diomedes hurled a spear that struck Agastrophus, Paeon's warrior's son, and smashed the joint of his hip, but his team was not close by for fast escape. A big mistake. The fool. His driver held them reined off at the side, while he advanced through the front ranks on foot, plowing on and on till he lost his own life. But Hector quickly marked them across the lines. He charged them both, full force, with a savage shout, and the Trojan battalions churning in his wake. Diomedes shuddered to see him coming on. The Lord of War cried out to Odysseus, quickly, close beside him. We're in for a shipwreck, a breaker rolling down on us. Look, this massive Hector. Brace for him. Stand our ground together. Beat him back. He aimed and hurled his spear's long shadow flew. A clean hit. No miss. Trained at the head of Hector. His helmet rich. But bronze glanced off bronze. and never grazed firm flesh. The helmet blocked it. Triple ply. With the great blank hollow eyes. A gift from Apollo. Sprinting a long way back downfield and fast. Hector rejoined his men. And sinking down onto one knee propped himself with a strong hand planted against the earth, and the world went black as night across his eyes. But soon, as Tydides followed up his spear, tracking its flight far down along the front where it struck in the sand, Hector caught his breath, and boarding his car, drove for his own main force, as he hurtled clear of the dark fates of death, Diomedes now shouting after him, shaking his spear. Now again, you've escaped your death, you dog, but a good close brush with death it was, I'd say. Now again, your Phoebus Apollo pulls you through, the one you pray to, wading into our storm of spears. We'll fight again. I'll finish you off next time, if one of the gods will only urge me on as well. But now, I'll go for the others, anyone I can catch. And he set to stripping his kill, Paeon Spearman's son. But at once, Paris... The lord of fair-haired Helen drew his bow at the rugged captain Diomedes, the archer leaning firmly against a pillar raised on the man-made tomb of Dardan's son, Ilus, an old lord of the realm in ancient days. As Diomedes was stripping strong Agastrophus bear, tearing the burnished breastplate off his victim's chest, the shield from his shoulders, and the heavy crested helmet, Paris, 
clenching the grip and drawing back his bow shot. No wasted shot. It whizzed from his hand and punched the flat top of Tadaiti's right foot. The shaft dug through and stuck fast in the ground. And loosing a heady laugh of triumph, Paris leapt from his hiding place and shouted out in glory, Now you're hit! No wasted shot, my winging arrow! But would to God I'd hit you deep in the guts and ripped your life away. Then my Trojans could catch their breath again, reprieved from death. They cringed at you like bleeding goats before some lion. But never flinching, staunch Diomedes countered. So brave with your bow and arrows, big bravado, glistening love locks, roving eye for girls. Come try me in combat, weapons hand to hand. Bow and spattering shafts will never help you then. You scratch my foot and you're vaunting all the same. But who cares? A woman or idiot boy could wound me so. The shaft of good-for-nothing cowards got no point, but mine's got heft and edge. Let it graze a man. My weapon works in a flash and drops him dead. And his good wife will tear her cheeks in grief. His sons are orphans, and he, soaking the soil red with his own blood, he rots away himself. More birds than women flocking around his body. So he yelled, and the famous spearman Odysseus rushed in close and reared up to shield him. Slipping behind Tydides dropped to a knee and yanked the winged arrow from his foot, as the raw pain went stabbing through his flesh. Back Diomedes jumped onto his car and told his driver to make for the hollow ships. Tydides racked with pain. That left the famous spearman Odysseus on his own, not a single Argive comrade standing by his side since panic seized them all. Unnerved himself, Odysseus probed his own great fighting heart. Oh, dear God, what becomes of Odysseus now? A disgraceful thing if I should break and run, fearing their main force. But it's far worse if I'm taken all alone. Look, Zeus just drove the rest of my comrades off in panic flight. But why debate, my friend? Why thrash things out? Cowards, I know, would quit the fighting now. But the man who wants to make his mark in war must stand his ground and brace for all he's worth. Suffer his wounds or wound his man to death. Weighing it all, heart and soul, as on they came, waves of Trojan spearmen crowding him tighter, closing in on their own sure destruction. Like hounds and lusty hunters closing, Ringing a wild boar till out of his thicket lair he crashes, wetting his white tusks sharp in his bent, wrenching jaws. And they rush in to attack, and under the barks and shouts you can hear the gnash of tusks. But the men stand firm, terrible, murderous as he is. So the Trojans ringed Odysseus dear to Zeus, rushing him straight on. But he lunged first, wounding lordly Diopides, spear shaft slicing into the Trojan's shoulder then cut down Thoon and Enemus in their blood. Cursidimus next, vaulting down from his car. Odysseus caught him up under the bulging shield with a jabbing spear that split him crotch to navel. The man writhed in the dust, hands clutching the earth. Odysseus left them dead and skewered Hippasus' son, one Carops, the blood brother of wealthy Socus. But Socus moved in quick as a god to shield his kin, standing up to his enemy, crying out, Odysseus! Wild for fame, glutton for cunning, glutton for war, today you can triumph over the two sons of Hippasus, killing such good men and stripping off their gear, or beaten down by my spear, you'll breathe your last. With that, he stabbed at Odysseus's balanced shield, straight through the gleaming hide the heavy weapon drove, ripping down and in through the breastplate finely worked, and it flayed the skin clean off Odysseus's ribs. But Pallas Athena would never let it pierce the hero's vitals. Odysseus knew the end had not yet come, no final, fatal wound, and drawing back, he hurled his boast at Socus. Poor man! Headlong death is about to overtake you! You've stopped my fighting against the Trojans, true, but I tell you here and now that a dark, bloody doom will take you down today. Gouged by my spear, you'll give me glory now. You'll give your life to the famous horseman Death! And spinning in terror, off he ran, but as he spun, Odysseus plunged a spear in his back between the shoulders. Straight through his chest, the shaft came jutting out, and down Socus crashed, Odysseus vaunting over him. Socus, son of Hippasus, skilled breaker of horses, 
So, death and its rampage outraced you. No escape. No, poor soldier. Now your father and noble mother will never close your eyes in death. Screaming vultures will claw them out of you, wings beating your corpse. But I, if I should die, my comrades in arms will bury me in style. He dragged the heavy spear of hardened Sokus squelching out of his own wound and bulging shield. As the fighter tore it out, the blood came gushing forth and his heart sank. And seeing Odysseus bleeding there, the Trojan troops exulted, calling across the melee, charging him in a mass as edging, backing off, he gave ground now, calling his own companions. Three shattering cries he loosed at full pitch, till Odysseus's head would burst. Three times Menelaus, tense for combat, heard his cries, and at once he called to Ajax standing near. Ajax, royal son of Telamon, captain of armies, my ears ring with his cries. Odysseus never daunted. He sounds like a man cut off and overpowered, mauled by Trojan ranks in the rough assault. Quick through the onset. Better save him now. I'm afraid he may be hurt, alone with the Trojans, brave as Odysseus is. A blow to all our troops. And Atreides led the way, and Ajax took his lead, striding on like a god until they found Odysseus dear to Zeus. But round him Trojans thronged like tawny jackals up in the mountains, swarming round a horned stag just wounded. A hunter's hit him, with one fast shaft from his bow, and the stags escaped, sprinting at top speed so long as his blood runs warm and the spring in his knees still lasts. But soon as the swift arrow saps his strength, the ravening carrion packs begin their feasting off on a ridge in twilight woods until some god, some power, drives the lion down against them. Claw mad and the panicked jackals scatter. The lion rends their prey. So packed around Odysseus, skilled and quick to maneuver, swarmed the brave bulk of Trojans. But still the hero kept on lunging, spearing, keeping death at bay. And in moved Ajax now, planted right beside him, bearing that shield of his like a wall, a tower. Trojans scattered in panic, bolting left and right while the fighting son of Atreus led Odysseus through the onslaught, bracing him with an arm till Rainsman drove his team and car up close. But charging down on the Trojans, Ajax killed Doriclus, bastard son of Priam. He wounded Pandacus next, wounded Lysander, Pyrrhus, then Pilartes. Wild as a swollen river hurling down on the flats, down from the hills in winter spate, bursting its banks with rain from storming Zeus, and stands of good dry oak, whole forests of pine it whirls into itself and sweeps along till it heaves a crashing mass of driftwood out to sea. So glorious Ajax swept the field, routing Trojans, scattering teams and spearmen in his onslaught. Nor had Hector once got wind of the rampage. Far off on the left flank of the whole campaign he fought his way, powering past Scamander's banks, where the heads of fighters fell in biggest numbers and grim incessant war cries rose around tall Nestor and battle-hard Idomeneus. Hector amidst them now engaged them with a vengeance, doing bloody work with lances flung and a master's horsemanship, destroying young battalions. Still, the Achaeans never would have yielded before the prince's charge if Paris, the lord of lovely fair-haired Helen, had not put a stop to Machaean's gallant fighting, striking the healer squarely with an arrow triple-flanged that gouged his right shoulder. Achaean's breathing fury feared for Machaean now. What if the tide turned and the Trojans killed the healer? Idomeneus suddenly called to Nestor. Pride of Achaea, quick! Mount your chariot! Mount Machaean beside you! Lash your team to the warships, fast! Full gallop! A man who can cut out shafts and dress our wounds— a good healer is worth a troop of other men. Nestor, the noble charioteer, did not resist. He mounted his car at once as Asclepius' son, Machaean, born of the famous healer, swung aboard. He lashed the team and on they flew to the ships, holding nothing back. That's where their spirits drove them to go. But riding on with Hector, Sobriones saw the Trojan rout and shouted, Hector, look at us here, engaging Argives with a vengeance, true, but off on the fringe of brutal all-out war while our central force is routed pell-mell, men and chariots flung against each other. Giant Ajax drives them. 
I recognized the man, that wall of a buckler slung around his shoulders. Hurry! Had our chariot right where the fighting's thickest. There! Horse and infantry hurling into the slaughter, hacking each other down, terrific war cries rising. With that, Sobrianes flogged their sleek team, and leaping under the whistling, crackling whip, they sped the careening car into both milling armies, trampling shields and corpses, axle under the chariot splashed with blood, blood on the handrails sweeping round the car, sprays of blood shooting up from the stallion's hooves and churning, whirling rims, and Hector straining to wade into the press and panicked ruck of men, charge them, break them down, he flung terror and stark disaster square in the Argive lines, never pausing, giving his spear no rest. Hector kept on raging, battling ranks on ranks, slashing his spear and sword and flinging heavy rocks, but he stayed clear of attacking Ajax man to man. But Father Zeus on the heights forced Ajax to retreat. He stood there a moment, stunned. Then, swinging his seven-ply oxhide shield behind him, drew back in caution, throwing a fast glance at his own Achaean troops like a trapped beast, pivoting, backpedaling, step by short step. Like a tawny lion when hounds and country field hands drive him out of their steadings filled with cattle, they'll never let him tear the rich fat from the oxen. All night long they stand guard, but the lion craves meat. He lunges in and in, but his charges gain him nothing. Thick and fast from their hardy arms the javelins rain down in his face, and waves of blazing torches. These the big cat fears, balking for all his rage, and at dawn he slinks away, his spirits dashed. So Ajax slowly drew back from the Trojans, spirits dashed, and much against his will, fearing the worst for Achaea's waiting ships. Like a stubborn ass, some boys lead down a road. Stick after stick they've cracked across his back, but he's too much for them now. He rambles into a field to ravage standing crops. They keep beating his ribs, splintering sticks. Their struggle child's play, till with one final shove they drive him off, but not before he's had his fill of feed. So with Telamon's son, great Ajax, then. Vaunting Trojans and all their far-flung allies kept on stabbing his shield, full center, no let-up. And now the giant fighter would summon up his fury, wheeling on them again, beating off platoons of the stallion-breaking Trojans. And now again he'd swerve around in flight. But he blocked them all from hacking passage through to the fast trim ships as Ajax all alone, battling on midfield between Achaean and Trojan lines, would stand and fight. Some spears that flew from the Trojans' hardy arms, hurtling forward, stuck fast in his huge shield, but showers of others, cut short halfway before they could graze his gleaming skin, stuck in the ground, still lusting to sink in flesh. But Euemon's shining son Eurypylus saw him overwhelmed by the Trojans' dense barrage of spears. Up to his side he dashed and flanked Great Ajax tight, let fly with a spear and the glinting spear point hit the son of Phosius, Apisaean, captain of armies, square in the liver, up under the midriff. His knees went limp as Eurypylus rushed in, starting to rip the armor off his shoulders. But now Paris spotted them stripping Apisaean, drew his bow at Eurypylus fast. He shot well, and the arrow struck him full in the right thigh, but the shaft snapped, the thigh weighed down with pain. Eurypylus staggered back to his massing comrades, dodging death, and shouted a stark, piercing cry. "'Friends! Lord of the Argives! All our captains! Come, wheel round! Stand firm! Beat the merciless day of death from Ajax! Overpowered! Look! By a pelting rain of spears! He can't escape, I tell you! Not this wrenching battle! Stand up to them! Ring great Ajax, Telamon's son!' So wounded Eurypylus pleaded, friends around him crowding, bracing shields against their shoulders, spears brandished high, and back to the bulking front came giant Ajax now. The fighter turned on his heels and took his stand, once he reached that wedge of Argive comrades. So on they fought like a mass of swirling fire as Neleus's foaming mares bore Nestor clear of battle, and bore Machaon, the expert healer, too. But now the brilliant runner Achilles watched and marked him. 
There he stood on the stern of his looming hollow hull, looking out over the uphill work and heartsick rout of war. He called at once to his friend-in-arms, Patroclus, shouting down from the decks. Hearing Achilles, forth he came from his shelter, striding up like the deathless god of war, but from that moment on his doom was sealed. The brave son of Menetius spoke first. Why do you call, Achilles? Do you need me? And the swift runner Achilles answered quickly, Son of Menetius, soldier after my own heart, now I think they will grovel at my knees, our Achaean comrades begging for their lives. The need has reached them, a need too much to bear. Go now, Patroclus, dear to Zeus, and question Nestor. Who's that wounded man he's bringing in from the fighting? He looks to me like Machaon from behind, clearly. Machaon had to foot, Asclepius's only son. But I never saw his eyes. The team sped by me, tearing on full tilt. Patroclus obeyed his great friend, and off at a run he went along the ships and shelters. Now, as soon as the others reached Nestor's tent, they climbed down on the earth that feeds us all. The driver, Eurymedon, freed the old man's team. The men themselves dried off their sweat-soaked shirts, standing against the wind that whipped along the surf, then entered the tent and took their seats on saddles. And well kempt Hegemede mixed them a bracing drink, the woman that old King Nestor won from Tenedos when Achilles stormed it, proud Arsinous's daughter, the prize the Achaeans chose to give Nestor because he excelled them all at battle tactics. First Hecamede pushed a table up toward them, handsome, sanded smooth, with blue enamel legs, and on it she set a basket, braided in bronze with onions in it, a relish for the drink, and pale gold honey along with barley meal, the grain's blessed yield. And there in the midst the grand glowing cup the old king brought from home, studded with gold nails, fitted with handles, four all told and two doves perched on each, heads bending to drink and made of solid gold, and twin supports ran down to form the base. An average man would strain to lift it off the table when it was full, but Nestor, old as he was, could hoist it up with ease. In this cup the woman, skilled as a goddess, mixed them a strong drink with Pramnian wine, over it shredded goat cheese with a bronze grater and scattered barley into it, glistening pure white, then invited them to drink when she had molded all. Now as the two men drank their parching thirst away, and they had just begun to please themselves with talk, confiding back and forth, there stood Patroclus, tall at the threshold, vivid as a god. Old Nestor saw him at once and started up from his polished chair, warmly grasped his hand and led Patroclus in, pressing him to sit. But standing off to the side, his guest declined. No time to sit, old soldier dear to the gods. You won't persuade me. Awesome and quick to anger, the man who sent me here to find out who's been wounded, the one you've just brought in. But I can see him. I recognize Machaon myself, the expert healer. So back I go to give Achilles this message. Well, you know, old soldier loved by the gods, what sort of man he is. That great and terrible man. Why, he'd leap to accuse a friend without a fault. But Nestor, the noble charioteer, replied at length, Now why is Achilles so cast down with grief for this or that Achaean winged by a stray shaft? He has no idea of the anguish risen through the army. Look, our finest champions laid up in the ships, all hit by arrows or run through by spears. There's powerful Diomedes brought down by an archer, Odysseus wounded, and Agamemnon, too, the famous spearman. And Eurypylus took a shaft in the thigh, and here, Machaon, I brought him in from the fighting, struck down by an arrow whizzing off the string. But Achilles, brave as he is, he has no care, no pity for our Achaeans. How long will he wait? Till our ships that line the shore go up in flames, gutted despite a last-ditch stand? And we ourselves are mowed down in droves? And I, what good am I? My limbs are gnarled now, the old power's gone. Oh, make me young again, and the strength inside me steady as a rock. As fresh as I was that time the feud broke out. Fighting a peons over a castle raid, I killed Itimonius, 
Hippiricus's gallant son who used to live in Elis. I was rustling their cattle in reprisal, you see, and he defending his herds, when a spear I hurled caught him right in the front ranks of herdsmen. Down he went, and round him his yokel drivers scattered home in panic. And what a lovely haul! What plunder we rounded up and herded off the plain! Fifty herds of cattle, as many head of sheep, as many droves of pig and as many goat flocks, ranging free, a hundred and fifty horses too, strong and tawny, broodmares every one, and under the flanks of many nursing foals. The whole lot. We drove them all into Pylos then, that very night, corralling them all inside the walls of Neleus, and father beamed, seeing how much I'd won, a young soldier out on his first campaign, and the herald cried out at the break of dawn, Pylians, come collect your debts from wealthy Elis, and a troop of Pylian chiefs turned out in force to carve up the spoils. The Apeans owed us all, few as we were in Pylos, hard-pressed as well, for mighty Heracles came against us years before. He ground our lives out, killing off our best. Twelve sons we were of the noble old Neleus, and I alone was left. The rest of my brothers perished in that rout. Riding high on our losses, the Apeans rose in arms, lording over us, harassing us with outrage after outrage. So now, out of Apean spoils, the old king chose a herd of cattle and a handsome flock of sheep. Three hundred head he picked, the herdsmen too. For wealthy Elis owed my father a heavy debt, four prize-winning thoroughbreds, chariot and all. They'd gone to the games, primed to race for the tripod, but Aegeus the warlord commandeered them on the spot and sent the driver packing, sick for his team. So now old Neleus, still enraged at it all, the threats to his man, the naked treachery, helped himself to a priceless treasure trove, but gave the rest to his people to divide, so none would go deprived of their fair share. But just as we were parceling out the plunder and offering victims to the gods around the city, right on the third day they came. The Apeans massed in a swarm of men and plunging battle stallions struck at the border, full force, and square in their midst the two Meliones armed to the hilt, and still boys, not quite masters yet in the ways of combat. Now then, there's a frontier fortress, three Oessa, perched on cliffs far above the Alpheus, at the edge of Sandy Pylos. The Apeans ringed that fort, keen to raise its walls, but once their troops had swept the entire plain, down Athena rushed to us in the night, a herald down from Olympus crying out, To arms! To arms! Nor did Pallas muster a slow, unwilling army there in Pylos, all of us spoiling for a fight. But Neleus would not let me arm for action. He'd hidden away my horses, thought his boy still green at the work of war. So I had to reach the front lines on foot, but I shone among our horsemen all the same, that's how Athena called the turns of battle. Listen, there is a river, the Minneos, emptying into the sea beside Arene's walls, and there we waited for goddess dawn to rise, the Pylian horses in lines while squads of infantry came streaming up behind. Then, from that point on, harnessed in battle armor, moving at forced march, our army reached the Alpheus's holy ford at noon. There we slaughtered fine victims to mighty Zeus, a bull to Alpheus River, a bull to Lord Poseidon, and an unyoked cow to blazing-eyed Athena. And then through camp we took our evening meal by rank and file, and caught what sleep we could, each in his gear along the river rapids. And all the while those vaunting Apeans were closing round the fortress, burning to tear it down. But before they got the chance, a great work of the war god flashed before their eyes, Soon as the sun came up in flames above the earth, we joined the battle, lifting a prayer to Zeus and Pallas. And just as our two opposing armies clashed, I was the first to kill a man and seize his team, the spearman Mulius, son-in-law to their king and wed to his eldest daughter, blonde Agamede, skilled with as many drugs as the wide world grows. Just as he lunged, I speared the man with a bronze lance, and Mulius pitched in the dust as I, I swung aboard his car, and I took my place in our front ranks of champions. How those hot-blooded Apeans scattered in terror, scuttling left and right when they saw him down, their chariot captain who'd outfought them all. Now I charged their lines like a black tornado. 
I captured fifty chariots there, and each time two men bit the dust, crushed beneath my spear. Now I would have destroyed the young Meliones, Actor's sons, if their real father, Poseidon, lord god of the open sea who shakes the earth, had not snatched them out of the fighting then, shrouded them round in clouds. But now Zeus gave our Pylian stunning triumph. Pushing Apeans north on the spreading plain we went, killing their troops, gathering up their burnished gear. Far as Buprassian, rich in wheat, our chariots rolled, all the way to Alenian rock and the high ground they call Elysian hell. But there, at last, Pallas Athena turned our forces back. I killed my last man there. I left him dead. There our Achaeans swung round Buprassian, heading their high-strung horses back to Pylos, where they all gave glory to Zeus among gods and among all men to Nestor. So such was I in the ranks of men, or was it all a dream? This Achilles, he'll reap the rewards of that great courage of his alone, I tell you. Weep his heart out far too late, when our troops are dead and gone. My friend, remember your father's last commands? That day he sent you out of Thea to Agamemnon. We were both there inside. I and Prince Odysseus heard it all in the halls, all your father told you. We'd come to the strong and storied house of Peleus, out for recruits across Achaea's good green land. There inside we found the old soldier Menetius, found you too, and Achilles close beside you, and the old horseman Peleus tending, burning the fat thighs of an ox to thundering Zeus, deep in the walled enclosure of his court. He was lifting up a golden cup and pouring wine, glistening wine to go with the glowing victim. You two were busy over the carcass, carving meat, when we both appeared and stood at the broad doors. Achilles sprang to his feet, he seemed startled, clasped the two of us by the hand and led us in. He pressed us to take a seat and set before us sumptuous strangers' fare, the strangers' right, and once we'd had our fill of food and drink, I led off with our plan, inviting the two of you to come campaign with us. How willing you were! And your father filled your ears with marching orders. The old horseman Peleus urging his son Achilles, Now, always be the best, my boy, the bravest, and hold your head up high above the others. An actor's son, Menetius, urging you. My child, Achilles is nobler than you with his immortal blood, but you are older. He has more power than you by far. But give him sound advice, guide him, even in battle. Achilles will listen to you, for his own good. So the old man told you, you've forgotten. But even now, late as it is, you could tell your Achilles all this, and your fiery friend might listen. Who knows? With a god's help, you just might rouse him now, bring his fighting spirit round at last. The persuasion of a comrade has its powers. But if down deep some prophecy makes him balk, some doom his noble mother revealed to him from Zeus. At least let Achilles send Patroclus into battle. Let the whole Myrmidon army follow your command. You might bring some light of victory to our Argives. And let him give you his own fine armor to wear in war, so the Trojans might take you for him. Patroclus, yes. Hold off from attack, and Achaea's fighting sons get second wind, exhausted as they are. Breathing room in war is all too brief. You're fresh, unbroken. They're bone-weary from this battle. You could roll those broken Trojans back to Troy, clear of all our ships and shelters. So old Nestor urged, and the fighting spirit leapt inside Patroclus. He dashed back by the ships toward Achilles, but sprinting close to King Odysseus's fleet, where the Argives met and handed out their laws, the ground where they built their altars to their gods. There he met Eurypylus, Euemon's gallant son, wounded, the arrow planted deep in his thigh and limping out of battle. The sweat was streaming down his face and back, and the dark blood still flowed from his ugly wound. But the man's will was firm. He never broke his stride. And moved at the sight, the good soldier Patroclus burst out in grief with a flight of winging words. Poor men! Lords of Argives! Oh, my captains! How doomed you are! Look! Far from your loved ones and native land, to glut with your shining fat the wild dogs of battle here in Troy. But come, tell me, Eurypylus, royal fighter, can the Achaeans somehow still hold monstrous Hector? 
or must they all die now, beaten down by his spear? Struggling with his wound, Eurypylus answered, No hope, Patroclus, prince, no bulwark left. They'll all be hurled back to the black ships, all of them. All our best in the old campaigns are laid up in the hulls. They're hit by arrows, pierced by spears, brought down by Trojan hands, while the Trojans' power keeps on rising, rising! Save me at least. Take me back to my black ship. Cut the shaft from my thigh, and the dark blood. Wash it out of the wound with clear warm water, and spread the soothing healing salves across it. The powerful drugs they say you learned from Achilles and Chiron, the most humane of the centaurs, taught your friend. And as for our own healers, Podolirius and Machaon, one is back in the shelters, wounded, I think. Machaon needs a good strong healer himself. He's racked with pain. The other's still afield, standing up to the Trojan's slashing onslaught. The brave son of Menetius answered quickly, Impossible! Eurypylus, hero, what shall we do? I am on my way with a message for Achilles, our great man of war. The plan that Nestor, Achaea's watch and ward, urged me to report. But I won't neglect you, even so, with such a wound. And bracing the captain, arm around his waist, he helped him toward his shelter. An aide saw them and put some ox hides down. Patroclus stretched him out, knelt with a knife and cut the sharp, stabbing arrow out of Eurypylus's thigh, and washed the wound clean of the dark, running blood with clear, warm water. Pounding it in his palms, he crushed a bitter root and covered the gash to kill his comrade's pain, a cure that fought off every kind of pain, and the wound dried and the flowing blood stopped. <laughs>